All right. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm Damien Freen. I'm a postdoc uh, jointly based at UC Davis and at the University of Oxford. And uh, just a quick thing, Ari and I have just swapped our talks around because the stuff I'm doing is a bit more introductory and will lead into her, her work a little bit better. So I'm really just fascinated by the social component of animal behavior. And uh, because this is a movement conference, I thought I'd talk a little bit first about how sort of we view um, the influence of the social component in, in an individual's animal movement. And then I'm going to give a really brief introduction into the project that we're using to try and address some of these questions, uh, the Bionic Baboon Project. And finally, um, I'm going to go through some of our sort of preliminary results, um, particularly looking at how groups are structured and how affiliations might be formed and maintained uh, within moving troops of baboons. So many people at this conference are presenting tracks on, on individuals uh, moving through space over a range of distances and so on. Um, but really few studies, as far as we can tell, are considering the effects of either conspecifics or heterospecifics in individual movement. So in this case here, you can see that each individual gazelle has to really consider not just its own state and its own motivations when it's moving, but also what the rest of its group is doing because they need, you need to stay with the group in order to avoid the predator lurking in the background. So in Randathan's uh, movement ecology framework, actually, I couldn't find really any mention of, of social aspects to, to any of this, but I guess we could put it inside this sort of black of gray box of external factors uh, in the corner there. So when we think about these external factors or environmental effects, we could really think that there might be two kinds. The first is the non-social, what we really traditionally think about, like ecological conditions such as habitat and weather and so on. And then there's the social, the social aspect. And social aspect, I think, could be broken down maybe into two, two different um, parts. The first is the group composition, and that's really uh, about who, what different kinds of members are part of the group, what are their phenotypes, what are their behaviors. And the second is like the group, it is the behavior of the group. So for example, if the group is moving at a certain speed, then in order to remain part of the group, you need to move at the same speed. So when you think about the latter, the, the, the behavior of the group, um, that's really been reasonably well addressed in the field of collective motion. So collective motion is really interested in how um, animal groups sort of stay together and, and move through space by sort of following these very simple local interaction rules that uh, typically um, include sort of areas of, of repulsion, which are right in the center there, which um, so that avoids uh, individuals colliding with each other. So you maintain a minimum distance and an area of, um, of alignment, which is sort of a, in the sweet spot. So you all align together so you can travel in the same direction and an area of attraction around the outside which basically says if you get too far away, then you want to get back close together. But really, when we think about animals uh, or individuals moving in groups in the wild, um, it probably incorporates some of the aspects of the ind their individual movement ecology and some of the aspects of interaction rules. And how this combination occurs or how the different rates of it happen might vary with ecological conditions as well as he individual heterogeneity. So they have dif individual differences. And for some of this stuff, I've been looking at some of this work in great tits um, and how they respond, how flocks of, of birds respond to sparrowhawk um, attacks. The second, so, so the second sort of fundamental aspect, I think, that's almost received no attention, even in collective behavior, is the, uh, the importance of, dif of individual differences in um, these interacting groups and the interaction between the phenotypes of the individual members. So for example, um, individuals might vary in body size, which could influence locomotion, speed, um, energy requirements, motivations, and so on. There could be different aspects to dominance. So for example, dominant individuals might want to remain in safer parts or safer zones in the, in the group, and so they might have slightly different rules. They might have lower, lower repulsion, for example, from others because they can repulse them. Leaders could exert um, influence on the group, but they, they might need to be in certain positions in the group. So for example, if there's leading from the front, then they might want to be at the front. And Ari's going to talk a bit more about how we, we're looking at leadership 
in the baboons. Individuals may also choose to move with preferred associates. So for example, and there's been some work on jackdaws, and jackdaw group movements comes down to like the basic unit is a pair rather than individual. So the pairs are kind of always sticking together, and then you get interaction between pairs. I just really want to point out that actually this social aspect of individual movement is probably also really important for what we typically think as non-social species. So for example, if, when individuals disperse, this dispersal will have to take into account where other individual, other conspecifics are, uh, are distributed across the landscape. And so there is a, there's still a social, um, or at least an individual interaction component to, to movement even in non-social species. So I hope I've convinced you that the social structure or the social components of, of movement or of the environment can really uh, influence individual movement. And so we work on uh, baboons in Kenya to try and understand or try and explore a little bit more about some of the parameters of this. So baboons are a widespread primate that's found throughout Africa. They occur throughout Africa and in lots of different species um, well, through sub-Saharan Africa. And then we worked in, in Kenya at a place called Impala Research Center, where uh, Meg and collaborators from MPIO um, captured um, the majority of adults in a troop. Basically, I think they captured 40, 34 individuals, of which 26 were adults, only missed one or two, and GPS collared every individual. And these GPS collars recorded high resolution, one hertz data, with very low error during daylight hours, so when the troop was moving, when, when they weren't sleeping, basically as well as continuous acceleration, and these last, this data went for about 30 days. So this is sort of the aggregation of all the data. So these data kind of provide sim um, simultaneous tracks that enables, en enable us to investigate how groups are structured, how individuals move together and maintain cohesion, how the group makes decisions about where and when to go because the troop always has to stay together so they never, they're never fix uh, fishing and we do this by combi we combine tools from social network analysis and collective behavior. So in this, in this um, animation, you can see that some of the heterogeneity in animal movement that exists at any given time, and also how they form sort of different clusters and so on, and how dynamic the whole system really is. I should just mention that these um, clusters that are detected um, this is just like a sort of pseudo proximity network, but it's um, all inferred using machine learning, which is really nice because it allows us to, to find non random um, clusters of individuals without having to set any a priori, a priori parameters, such as like minimum distance thresholds and things like that. And so, the first sort of question I thought um, I'd, we wanted to look at was. How does group structure, um, how does group movement behavior change uh, with habitat and speed? So we've put just the points of, the, of some of the raw data, and so on the y-axis is the mean dyadic distance. So rather than having group spread, we calculate mean dyadic, uh, we, so rather than having group diameter, we calculate the group spread, which is a more, slightly more robust measure. And you find that like, when there's basically no, when the troop's not moving, you get this really large variance large range, but as soon as the troop starts moving, you get this negative sort of relationship. So as the faster the troop goes, the, the tighter they have to be together to maintain cohesion. What I thought was really interesting about this plot is you get this kind of like threshold level that I'd like to explore a little bit more, that basically there's a sort of inverse relationship where the, when the troop, the troop goes a certain speed, they just basically can't be more than a certain uh, distance apart, otherwise they would probably lose contact. So in terms of the habitats, we classified the habitat using um, by looking at the uh, doing classification algorithm on the satellite imagery, and we found we've got three dense, medium, and open habitat. And here, with this, this is a bit more formal than the last analysis. We used generalized equation, generalized estimating equations, and we found that there's a significant um, larger spread when the group is in open habitat. So again, suggesting that that they can basically maintain. Um, you know, line of sight and so on, so they can maintain cohesion uh, even though they spread out uh, more widely. And we also found that um, 
the troops traveled faster as well in open habitat, so you get this interesting interaction that uh, we're, trying, we're going to explore somewhat more. Perhaps more fundamentally, we want to find out whether um, individuals maintain some sort of consistency in their position within the group and how this might relate to sort of their phenotype or their, their current state. So when we plotted just like three, 3D histograms of, of individuals over time, so this is like days one to three, and three different individuals, we found there's like this really clear consistency that at the top individual was tended to be found right in the center of the group, individual two tended to be res relatively peripheral, and individual three seemed to have some kind of preference for being towards the front of the group. And so moving is going up in all of these plots. So when we fit this in a generalized mi linear mixed model framework, uh, we can get out the um, in sort of position of individuals and position of different classes. So these each dot is an individual in this, in this area here and colored by their, their class, which is down the bottom. And so the front of the group is up the top. So this is front to back. And then left to right is sort of lateral distance so out from the center of the group. And what we find really strikingly is all these sort of sub-adults and juveniles are found really in the middle of the group. So they sort of seem to be staying in sort of safer positions if you're thinking about predation or whatever, or, or thinking about like maintaining cohesion of the group, it's le less risk of being separated. Whereas adult males are tended to be sort of really ahead of the group, and adult females were sort of spread throughout. So there were some that were consistently out and forward all the time, and then some that were always lagging behind. And this is kind of makes sense because baboons have really clear dominance hierarchies on the female lineages. So, adult, so females inherit sort of um, their dominance rank, and that never changes through their lifetime. They're always, so the most dominant female remains the most dominant female for the rest of her life. But we're still exploring dominance and the relationship with all this. We haven't got answers on that yet. So another thing we could do is from, from all of these tracks and the end individuals moving through the tracks, we could build like we could build networks, we could build a proximity network. This is a proximity network, who tends to be closer to who. But as we saw, individuals also have preferred spatial positions. So really a key question is how do we identify links in this network that are social, so which individuals are really hanging out together, and which individuals are just found in the same place just because they like to be in the same part of the group all the time. So we've just been playing around this, with this in the last um, few weeks and we've sort of come up with this method where we divide the spread of the group into a grid that's centered around the middle of the group and then we can map each individual into each individual grid um, location and then we can repeat this and then we can also map which in individuals are co-occurring in each in each grid and from that we can um, calculate a probability of an, of an individual being found in a grid and we can calculate the probability of an individual co-occurring with an, a dyad occurring in a grid and then we can get the probabilities of these two happening these two things happening from that we thought we'd uh, we could calculate the basically the log ratio of the probability of co-occurring um, divided by the probability of co-occurring given that your movements are independent so we can plot this for each uh, this log value for each each dyad so here the white ones so along the diagonal individuals are also co-occurring with themselves and so, but there's some other clear co-occurrences. Now we can compare this to, to randomized data. So this is just an example of one randomization where we've come up, we're coming up, um, we've sort of designed a randomization routine where we can randomize tracks during independent sampling periods. And when we do lots and lots of randomizations, uh, we can construct basically a significance test and find which two-tailed significance test we can find attracted and avoided um, associations. And from that, we could build an affiliation network. Um, this is not actually the, right, the same affiliation network as the other one, but because I haven't done it yet. But this is a co-sitting network. But the idea is then, for us, would be to incorporate all of this um, information that we gather about the different uh, processes that are happening um, in the movement of, of individuals and to build all these into agent-based models so we can basically model the dynamics of, of movement and see if we can both predict how individuals move through space based on what their associates are doing, but also if we can 
um, really clear to identify using like a, a model selection framework which parameters are really important. So for example, is it social affiliation, like preferred associations, or is it individual positioning, is it leadership that really define how and where individuals are found within moving groups. With that, I'd like to thank all of the people that have been involved and funded the collection of the data, and thanks to my co-authors and um, co-researchers, collaborators on this project in analyzing the data. Thank you for coming. Yes. Um, there we had like a 10 meter grid, but we st we, we've only sort of done it once, so we haven't quite explored how um, sensitive it is to that. Yeah, so the problem with the distance thing is it doesn't really pull apart whether they're closer together just because they prefer to stay in the same place. So you need to sort of have a look at that over the range. Yeah, we're, we're interested in like the, uh, the trying to, to tease apart those two co-processes. They're probably both happening and trying to find out which ones might be influencing different dyads. Yeah. Can you get real data for a person who's sex classes and then put some real data analysis to see if that's a common thing and then use that information to inform models? Mm. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. I wonder if you're able to tell if the animals at the front of the group are being excited or excluded. So Ari is going to talk about that yeah. next. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, that's in in this in this you get the so it's a two tailed. So you get both those that are really uh, found together, like co-occurring more than expected by chance, and those are co-occurring less than expected by chance. So yeah, I mean that's that's a huge part of it as well. <laughs> 